Live streaming is on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Undercurrent News' Pollock in the Pandemic Markets Production Trade Webinar. I'm Tom Seaman, the Editorial Director of Undercurrent News. First of all, sorry for the, um, the delay in logging in there. We're having a few technical issues, but hopefully everything will work now and we're, we're, we're on our way. So first things first, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this webinar, which is JP Clausen & Co, a global supplier of Pollock, Fillets, Surimi, and other whitefish and pelagics. Sponsors allow us to put time and effort into these webinars and keep them free and open for everyone. You can find out more about the company on the sponsor page on the webinar platform. Jens Peter Clausen, CEO of the company, is also on our panel. But as I always say, the contents of our webinars are put together by Undercurrent News and a sponsor has the same level of input as any other panelist. So over the next hour and a half, we're going to try and get a handle on what the coronavirus pandemic means for the market and production of Pollock, which is the world's biggest volume fishery for human consumption. Broadly speaking, Pollock has had a pretty good pandemic. Um, this is especially true for single frozen fillets, which are mainly used for retail products like fish fingers, uh, where demand has been very strong. Prices on single frozen fillets have stayed firm and the supply outlook is tight, which we'll come on to to cover more later. Surimi demand has also stayed pretty firm, with the supply of competing warm water Surimi base from Asia continuing to decline, which is another topic which we'll touch upon later in the webinar. As for double frozen blocks and then the headed and gutted fish used to produce them, it's a different story. Due to a higher level of exposure to food service, double frozen prices have been depressed and the gap with single frozen has widened. Prices for the h &G from Russia used to produce double frozen blocks have also been depressed this year. However, both prices for h &G and double frozen blocks are now firming. So we've convened a top panel from the Pollock supply chain to discuss the outlook on all of this and more. I'd like to, to start by getting the panel to introduce themselves and then I'm going to give a short presentation to set the scene with what's happened so far. This should take about 10 to 15 minutes. Then we'll have a panel discussion for about 50 to 60 minutes. And then I hope to allow around 20 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. Also, please ask questions as we go along on the webinar page where you're logged in. Um, and then we'll get to the questions at the end. But you can just ask them as the, as the webinar progresses and then we'll kind of cover them in a, in a Q&A &A at the end. So let's um, go alphabetically in order for the intros. Um, and so Jens Peter, maybe you could kick us off, please. Yes, thank you very much. And, uh, hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, my name is Jens Peter Clausen. I'm uh, the uh, CEO or MD of uh, JP Clausen and Company. Um, if you look at the organizational structure where we fit uh, under our parent company, uh, Nippon Suisan in Japan, uh, we are uh, in a company based in Denmark, uh, together with Nordic Seafood. Um, we, uh, in the Southern Company, uh, take care of all the uh, bulk and uh, industrial raw material supply, and uh, Nordic Seafood looks after the uh, retail food service uh, side of our business. Uh, we do about 100,000 uh, tons of products uh, per year. And uh, if you look at um, uh, our presence, uh, we have about 20 offices uh, on a global uh, basis uh, in our little group. If you then work, uh, uh, look up the uh, organizational ladder, uh, then uh, our colleagues in, uh, in Europe, uh, in the Suey-owned companies, uh, and we have a presence in, uh, in the European Union of about uh, 900 million uh, euros per year. Uh, in JP Clausen Company, <clears throat> we mainly focus on blocks, fillets, portions, pelagics, shrimp, and surimi. Uh, and for all of our uh, sales and distribution, uh, our product program consists of uh, mainly owned uh, uh, catch or also external catch. So that constitutes our product program. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, thanks, James Peter. Maybe, um, Klaus, you could go next, please. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, good day to all the audience. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you, Tom, for being invited. Uh, my name is Klaus Rune. I'm working in the fish industry for more than 30 years in various positions, mainly in procurement. In 2016, I joined uh, Espersen uh, and be the category fish sourcing manager means being responsible purchasing processed frozen fish for Espersen's finished goods production plants. 
these are mainly fillets, fillet blocks, IQF fillets or portions. Uh, briefly, some information about Espersen. It's a Danish um, fish processing company founded 1937 on uh, Bornholm. At this time, fishing, processing of Baltic cod was the main activity. Since then, the company changed significantly. Today, Espersen has various production sites from Vietnam to Novgorod and Russia, Lithuania, Poland, and still in Denmark. These are primary uh, processing plants and secondary processing plants. Primary oh. means converting fresh fish or headed and gutted fish into various fillets or portions. Secondary processing means uh, producing <coughs> finished products for the European market and others. Uh, the total annual output is 70,000 tons manufactured by nearly 3,000 employees. We sell our products into many different markets, mainly in Europe, but also globally. Retail, food service, quick service restaurants, business to business are one of the sales segments. We are supplying one of the major global QSR chain in Europe, Middle East and Russia. Our company is led by uh, Klaus B. Nielsen, which is also the current chairman of the Ground Fish Forum. Thank you. Thanks, Klaus. Maybe Pascal, you can give us an intro. Okay, good night, uh, good morning or good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Pascal Guinegues. I uh, have been in the Surimi business for the past 25 years. I started my own around uh, 20 years ago. My company name is uh, Future Seafood, Surimi Tech. Uh, we are trading Surimi worldwide, but mostly from Asia. I also manage Surimi factories in uh, Vietnam, and uh, we design, consult, uh, do engineering, develop new technology in uh, processing Surimi, particularly for tropical fish. Great, thanks, Pascal. Um, Stiri, maybe you can go now. Yes, thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, webinar. So my name is Stuller Haraldsson. I'm the managing director of uh, Noripo Europe, which is one of the uh, sales companies of, of uh, Noripo Group. Noripo is the biggest fishing company of, of Russia. And uh, fillets in the world. We are a significant producer of the sea product, but also we also have uh, Processing plants. Thanks, Terry. Um, Rasmus, maybe you can go now and finish us off. Yeah, um, I'll do it quickly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rasmus Sorensen. Uh, I'm with American Seafoods Company in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we're a fishing company uh, mainly active in Alaska and off the coasts of Oregon and Washington. We operate a fleet of six catcher processors um, and predominantly catch four species, uh, Alaska Pollock being the largest one in terms of volume, followed by Pacific Hake, um, also called whiting here uh, domestically in, in the US, um, and cod and yellowfin sole. Um, we have full production on our vessels, full utilization. Um, our core product formats are, of course, uh, single fillet uh, blocks, uh, single frozen fillet blocks and surimi base. Um, but we utilize the entire fish. So we also produce rendering products like fish meal, fish oil, um, etc. We catch in excess of 350,000 metric tons of uh, fish annually. Um, thank you for the invitation this morning, Tom. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks, Rasmus, and thanks to everyone. Right, I'm going to get to a quick um, presentation now, give a bit of a kind of um, an overview of, uh, of of the situation so far, and then we can we can get to the panel. Just going to share my screen. It should be working there. Um. <coughs> So just a little summary of the of the situation we've seen so far. Um, some of this was covered in the intro, um, but in essence, we've seen single frozen prices for Pollock stay pretty firm, driven by the retail demand mentioned earlier. Surimi, a similar picture, but H&G and double frozen prices have really been in the doldrums this year due to the kind of higher exposure and food service of, of that product group, um, but are now kind of recovering somewhat. 
Um, we've then seen major disruptions in actually getting H&G raw material um, from Russia into China for processing um, due to um, this coronavirus crackdown, which has happened in Qingdao recently. Um, we've also had a, a kind of situation with um, the Philip block and Serenity production in BC and in Alaska um, dropping quite considerably um, due to, to small fish and poor catching, which, which Rasmus can maybe um, cover, cover more later. As for Russia, I mean, Russia is, um, is producing similar quantities of, um, of, um, of, uh, of fillets as, as it produced in, in 2019, but considerably down on the 2018 level. And then we've got an interesting topic, which I guess we can explore later, which is the expulsion of Russian fishery company from the, um, the Pollock Catchers Association, which is the, the industry group for, uh, for the Russian sector, um, which, you know, which would seem to, well, which, which does seem to mean that um, that the company will will not be able to sell um, MSC certified products um, this year. Um, so that will be an interesting thing to kind of cover uh, next year rather, not this year. Um, looking quickly at the pricing situation, um, we've got a uh, situation with PBO pricing where um, prices have been, uh, you know, been on the rise since the, uh, since the kind of crash in, in um, the end of 2017 with Pacific Andes. Um, been firm, come down slightly maybe, um, but been firm kind of for, for all of this year on, on PBO. It's a very, very different um, picture on the, the H&G front. Um, you can see here the price came down pretty low um, this year and it's kind of, it's in recovery, but the, um, the price is, is, is still very much down on the previous two years if you look at the, um, this time of year. And then, yeah, looking um, looking here at the um, the 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 imports of uh, of H and G from from China, um, you can actually see that the the level has dropped kind of even below the 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 price which um, which we, we previously showed. There was, I think, around forty thousand tons imported by by China in September, an average price of eight hundred and sixty four um, per metric ton. If you look at the data, which is 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 pretty incredibly low. And this is obviously that the final figure here is for September, so the prices since then have, have increased. Turning now to look at uh, the double frozen um, exports from China, um, you can see here this is European import data. Um, you can see here from the from the European import data a pretty um, dramatic decline in um, in the prices going into Europe. I mean, the average looking at the kind of data and averaging out the the price um, for for week forty one was. Two euros thirty-four, um, which kind of translates to two two thousand eight hundred dollars per metric ton, but um, that's kind of it's kind of a blend is blended price, so it's basically all products, uh, all Pollock products imported from China. So it would include more high-value single uh, IQF and products like that, which um, which I guess are bringing up the price because the the you know the the talk in the industry has been that the actual double frozen price has um, has been you know quotes even down to two six. Um, however, that sounds like it's for small volumes and people clearing out stock and the prices of now now firming and seems like two eight and up is, is more the level be, being talked. Looking quickly at the um, US um, PBO exports, um, you can see again, this is, shows the pretty steady picture here. You've got the, the red shows the kind of average price development and the, um, the bars of the, uh, the volumes. Um, but, but yeah, you can see a bit of a decline in volumes in, in August, which is interesting. Um, and it's also a similar picture for Surimi exports to Japan. You've got this pretty, you know, this, this looks like it's going all over the place with the red line, but it's actually would be quite, quite steady in terms of the, what the prices are being agreed at. This is just the kind of fluctuations of volume. Um, but, but August, the volume is, is down slightly um, for Surimi exports to Japan. Looking at Europe, again, a similar picture with, with Surimi. We've got, um, you know, I guess in Europe, Surimi would be predominantly a retail product. Um, some, some sales in sushi trade and you can see you know good good pricing although prices have dropped according to this data which is was up to September um, but they are they're up year on year if you look at the comparison to September last year and then turning to look at the um, the US uh, US production levels it's a pretty um, we can touch upon this later in, in the panel and Rasmus I'm sure will have some comments on this but the the, the B season uh, production for both PBO and Ceremi has been kind of down dramatically it's, 42% drop uh, according to the latest data, um, which is up to October the 10th. So 42% drop for PBO to 46,000 tons. 
Cerimi down 18.5% um, to, to 86,000 tonnes, so a big drop on both in BC. Looking at the, the complete year, um, this is the complete year for, for Alaskan production. You can see the 2020 on the, on, on the right. Again, um, uh, Cerimi, Cerimi down year on year, PBO down. Um, and actually, if you look at the, the year on year data, it's going to, there's 36 or well, almost 37,000 um, less PBO, you know, ton, uh, volume of PBO compared to 2019, which is you know, quite a significant drop, really. Uh, and then with, um, with regards to Cerimi, um, there's also a significant decline. And yeah, and a 23% uh, um, drop across the board. Um, with, with with all fillets covering uh, PBO, deep skin, and PBI to about 150,000 tons. So can this gap be closed? Um, which is you know, it's not. It, I really am not too sure whether it can. I mean, we've got a situation where um, at the minute, 91% um, of the um, 1.4 uh, 1.4 million metric ton tack has been caught. Um, at this point last year, 98% of the tack had been caught. But it's not so much a question of, of fishing, it's to do with fish size and other things. So I mean, it seems very unlikely that the, the shortfalls will be made up um, to, to any kind of significant degree. But Marasmus can comment more on that on the panel. And you can see here we've got um, across the board drops for we've got the inshore uh, on, on the left, the catcher processors, the motherships and the, the CDQ. In fact, the motherships are the only, the, the only kind of category which are up. All the others, the catches are kind of down um, year on year, um, which is, you know, shows the kind of, I guess, cross the board poor fishing that they've seen in Alaska. And then here we've got um, a chart showing the, the Russian fillet uh, production levels, um, which for, for 2020 shows pretty pretty decent picture, um, just over uh, 52,000 tonnes um, with the, the, the data through to the end of August, um, which is slight increase on 2019, but uh, down quite a bit on 2018 when close to 60,000 tonnes have been produced by this period. And then in looking to the future, looking to 2021, we've got an um, interesting thing with Russian fisheries volumes, uh, which you know, people estimate probably around 13,000 tonnes of, of PBO blocks, um, you know, may not have the MSC certification um, as things stand at the minute, um, the way it looks now. Then looking to overall Russian production, um, We've got uh, this, this. This basically shows a full year-on-year -year comparison across all product types, and you can see the yellow, the big chunk, is you know, significant volumes of H and G being produced, over six hundred thousand tons, um, and then a kind of a healthy increase in in whole round, which is up thirty thousand tons to the pit um, for the period. And then you know, a question which maybe Steery will have some thoughts on is: is will will Russia? Will Russia pass um, the the record years of, of production and catches in two thousand of two thousand sixteen and two thousand seventeen this year? And you can see here the the data for twenty twenty is uh, is through to the end of August, um, and the previous years are all the full years. So it's kind of closing in on on that on, on those kind of levels. This is a, a visualization of the historic uh, Russian catch. Um, again, the twenty twenty level is is through to the end of August. Um, and it shows, yeah, 1.4 um, million metric tons were caught in that period. Uh, the TAC is 1.834. So at the end of August, there was still 400,000 tons to go. Um, and again, maybe Sturry could give some thoughts later on whether all of this will be caught and, and whether the kind of record could potentially overhaul um, the, the previous record levels of 2017 when 1.728 million metric tons was caught. Because the MSC uh, MSC certification is a big deal with with Pollock, we've visualised the the MSC uh, Russian MSC, uh, MSC catch here. Um, this year it's been pretty pretty strong. Nine hundred and twenty one thousand metric tons caught in the Sea of Okhotsk through through August. Um, Nine hundred forty one thousand tons were caught the previous year, but I guess the vessels will go back out and catch again. So that level could be overhauled. Uh, will, well, will more than likely be overhauled in in twenty twenty. And then obviously Russia, um, looking to the future for Russian MSC production, um, Russia plans to get the uh, West Bering Sea certified. That's been entered to, to full certification. And that, according to the, the level, um, the TAC for this year, um, that would be 275,000 tonnes. 
uh, of that would be the certified volume. So potential for more um, certified fish from Russia coming in the future. And then on Russian supply, some big news coming out this morning. Um, the, the, the Russian quota, uh, the Russian quota was announced, or the TAC was announced rather, because there is a, a distinction. And the overall level is, is up um, slightly to 1.996 million metric tons. Um, but the MSC approved portion, the Sea of Hotsk, is down very slightly to 1.06 million um, metric tons. And then we've got a, uh, an increase in the, the West, West Bering Sea portion, which is what Russia wants to get MSC certified, up to 415,000 metric tons from 390. Although that 390 um, level was, was, I think, a mid-season increase. It was increased from about 80,000 tons to that in June um, this year. Then looking at the US forecast, um, the, the US um, TAC has not been set yet. That'll be happening later in the year at, I guess, a digital um, Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting, which is usually held in Anchorage every year. Um, I guess that'll be digital. So, so yeah, the, the, the US quota has not been set, but the, the Groundfish Forum forecast um, is for pretty steady, really, a slight drop, but um, landings of 1.507 million metric tons from the US. Um, and yes, it's a sort of similar picture with Japan, South Korea and others, you know, the kind of smaller pollock producing countries, a pretty stable picture. So what's next? There's really a lot of question marks, which we're going to touch upon in the panel. But um, some of the things we'd, we'd, you know, we're going to cover are, you know, will, will Alaskan fish size support better production levels of fillets and surimi this year? Um, will gap close between single and double frozen blocks? Because that's kind of widened to record levels this year. Um, how will Russian fisheries lack of MSC impact the market? Or, or might, you know, there might there be some solution which, you know, solves the problem? Uh, will the spread between MSC and non-MSC fish widen? Uh, due to due to the, some of the situations outlined uh, in the pan, in the presentation, and will will COVID issues continue to hamper Russian sales to China, um, because that you know doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. And then I guess it'd be very interesting to touch upon the impact of the Russian new builds. I mean, there's it's not going to be a wave of them, but we'll, there'll be a Russian fishery vessel arriving at the end of, of this year, and I guess we'll, we'll, well we'll start fishing next year. So yeah, we we'll, you know that's a big question mark really. I mean, how how that how is that going to kind of reshape the Pollock sector with um, more of these kind of new Russian vessels arriving. So there we go. Stopped. Right. So I guess seeing as we finished, really talking about supply in the presentation. I think it'd be good to start with Rasmus to maybe give us some thoughts on, on what's, you know, your, your take on what's been happening in bee season with the poor fishing in Alaska, and then give us some views on the, um, on the supply and production outlook for 2021. Rasmus, you're muted. You're muted. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Cheers. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. Uh, thank no you, problem. Tom, um, and and thank you for taking the time to put those slides together. It's uh, uh, sure a lot going on in the Pollock industry globally right now. A lot of a lot to keep uh, keep our eyes on. Uh, very exciting times indeed. Um, before I talk about what we've experienced in Alaska this bee season, I think it's it's um, uh, prudent to remind everybody that we come out of a couple of years with record fishing levels in Alaska, but also record yield levels. We've been on, on rather large size fish the last two, three years, uh, which has really helped industry to optimize production and especially optimize the yield. So a direct comparison between what we have experienced the last couple of years and, and this year is, is perhaps not, not fair. Um, that said, we have definitely experienced a change uh, this bee season um, away from the year classes that we've been catching on the last couple of years, two, three years, uh, which has been the uh, 14, 15 year classes predominantly uh, until uh, this year where we've definitely experienced a, a high influx of younger year classes in Alaska. 
And that has, of course, led to a, a bigger proportion of smaller fish size being caught uh, uh, on average throughout the season. And uh, when we get from rather large fish to smaller fish, um, that, of course, has an impact on, on the yields that we're able to get um, out of the fish as well. So when you look at the production numbers, and you've touched on it um, um, a couple of times now, Tom, we are quite a bit behind uh, the same time last year in terms of output, uh, both on the Philip Block side, but also on the Surimi side. And that is a direct uh, um, result of, of course, slower fishing, as you mentioned, but also uh, lower yields than what we've been used to here lately. Um, these numbers that you, you referred to in your presentation are dated October 10th. Uh, we're, we're still fishing in Alaska and we will continue to fish up until the end of, uh, of the season on, on October 31st. So uh, that major gap that you've alluded to uh, is going to narrow a little bit before the season is over. But I think with, with the way the season has progressed so far, it's, it's evident that we will be behind our production numbers on pretty much all product formats uh, this year compared to what we saw in 2019. Um, looking a little bit into 2021, it, it, it's quite clear that that could create a little bit of tightness in the supply chain. Um, we know that the demand for our products, um, our core frozen products, has stayed healthy uh, through these, uh, this pandemic. Um, you know, Paul, Pollock is very fortunate because a lot of our uh, raw material ends up in retail products around the world. And retail, as we all know, has been performing quite well uh, as we've been navigating through these uh, troubled times. Um, so the demand has stayed healthy for, for pretty much all frozen products formats uh, through this, the last six to seven, eight months. And uh, so with less supply coming into the supply chain, um, inventories being rather low uh, everywhere around the world, we could uh, experience a little bit of tightness going into 2021. Um, um, you also asked Tom a little bit about the product mix and, and what we see uh, supply wise uh, during 2021. And I think, our industry has been pretty steady in terms of the product mix, uh, the balance between Philip Blocks and Surimi. And generally, if you go back a, a number of years, um, it is quite well balanced right down the middle, roughly 50% Surimi production, 50% block production. Um, I think uh, going into 2021, there's not going to be any major changes in that uh, shift, uh, although uh, the lower yields that we have experienced this bee season could be with us uh, in 2021 as well, because you know we are uh, expecting to continue to fish on those uh, younger year classes. If you were to um, if you were to kind of guess, how much do you think that the the um, volume, the say PBO and and Surimi volumes are going to end up? You know, what's what's the deficit at the end of the year, roughly speaking? Like you know, in, in the time that's left, how much of it can be made up? Oh, that's a good question. That depends on what what uh, what products the industry focuses on using here in the last few days of the season. Uh, we know demand is strong across all product formats, so uh, you know businesses will focus on the products that are best suited for the raw material that they're running through their plant. Um, I, you know, it's it's hard to say. You you mentioned 36,000, 30, 37,000 metric tons uh, deficit between uh, 2019 PBO and 2020 PBO so far. Um, I, I can't. I think it's going to be a lower number this year than it was last year for sure. But but I hate to speculate in where that number exactly is going to end up, Tom. But it is going to be a significant number, of course. There's just not enough time to get caught up here. Okay, great. Well, well, thanks, thanks, Rasmus. That's that's really really interesting stuff. And that, and Stiri, maybe um, I guess you could you could follow on from that and discuss the the Russian um, situation. You know, obviously the the TAC was was announced this this morning. Um, so it'd be great to get some sense from you as to, you know, both in both, you know, how, how, how will Russian, how has Russian fishing been in the kind of the back end of, um, of this year? Because the data, um, data went up to the end of August. And then, you know, what's your, um, you know, what's your view on, on, on 2020 with, in, in light of the, uh, the TAC, which has been announced? Yes. Um, I mean, as you, as you correctly said earlier in, uh, in 2018, we had a record uh, production of block in Russia, but since then we've seen uh, uh, fish size being significantly smaller. So we've seen a lot of small fish in 2019 and, and so far this year. So this means that we, we have um, we have been producing less block in both 2019 and 2020 compared to 2018. Uh, so, uh, 
So you, we are very likely to end up with similar numbers uh, this year to what we saw last year. Uh, block total block production will probably be you know, around sixty thousand ton, uh, and uh, and the H and G production will probably be similar to to last year as well. Uh, so the TAC for two thousand twenty on uh, was uh, announced recently, and and that is now uh, going to be one million nine hundred ninety. Uh, 6,000 ton, but it, it's worth noting that uh, the quota allocated to uh, to the fishing companies will probably be uh, less. So it's probably going to be somewhere around 1.9 million because the difference is uh, there is some scientific quota put aside and, and some coastal quota and, and so on. But, but there is expected to be an increase in, in cuts next year again. and. Uh, and the size of the fish will probably uh, have a lot to say about what will actually be produced next year. So what, what the vessel owners will do, and they will make sure that they uh, maximize the capacity of, of each vessel. So, so, uh, so if we will continue to, to see smaller fish in the, in the catch, uh, the block production, for example, will be restrained. I think it's very likely that the producers will uh, strive to do maybe a bit more of block. But like I say, it, it will depend on, on size of fish, rate of catching, and, and so on. OK, great. Um, well, thank, thanks, Thierry. So m maybe, Jens Peter, you could give your take, you know, seeing as obviously, um, you know, you, you've got the, the, the access with the, the Nisiri Upstream companies in Alaska. Um, so I'd be interested to get your your take on this, uh, you know, Alaskan kind of um, production situation and then outlook for next year. Oh, you're muted, Jens Peter. There we go. Our moderator was going to fix that, but uh, we'll do it manually then. That's fine. Um, well, if I compound all your numbers and the comments from the uh, story and um, Erasmus, um, I think this is exactly what we're seeing in the market. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a number of uh, of uh, contracts that were not fulfilled uh, in, in 2020 due to um, the lower catches or smaller fish. Um, so, so, so those volumes will have to be moved over to uh, the A season uh, 2021. So you can say they then start and a new year being behind uh, uh, several thousand tons uh, that needs to be caught up. Uh, that again transpires into uh, what's 2021 going to be looking like. I think we're going to be starting out with a uh, with a squeeze, uh, and then we'll see uh, the demand. Uh, uh, what I heard before as well, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, Alaskan Pollock going to retail. Uh, it seems as if it's continuing the, the pandemic, so there will be uh, more demand. Uh, maybe when the uh, um, service segment comes on again. Uh, there will be more demand again for certainly single frozen uh, uh, pollock. So the outlook that we see is that, yeah, we are struggling this year to fulfill all our, all our orders. We're pushing them into the next year. Uh, so uh, in our outlook, uh, it will be a tight year. And of course, that affects the pricing uh, when demand is so high. Um, so that's our take uh, from, from the market. Okay, great. Well, well, thanks, um, thanks, Jens Peter. Maybe we can move quickly to um, to Surimi and and Rasmus. It'd be great if you could kind of give a bit of a, an update on on what's been happening in the markets for for Pollock Surimi um, during the pandemic, and then you know, in light of the the reduction in um, in in US in US production. I mean, obviously, that some of it will be made up, but there's going to be reduced production. Um, give us a bit of a sense about what you see happening in, in the market for Surimi in 2021. Yeah, I, um, you already touched on it, Tom, for sure. I mean, again, Surimi is experiencing the same uh, type of strong demand as we're seeing on the Philip block side during these pandemic times. Um, a lot of the Surimi ends up in products that goes to retail, both here in North America and Europe and uh, as well as in Asia. So um, we've definitely enjoyed good, strong demand for uh, most of the product formats made from Surimi raw material uh, during these past few months. Um, and at the same time, as we've talked about now, supply is tight. Uh, we're going to come out with uh, less production in Alaska this uh, bee season. 
and on the year overall. And I think uh, Pascal is going to touch on some tightness in supply out of the tropics as well. So uh, right now we're in a situation where we have very uh, light inventory uh, levels of Surimi raw material anywhere in the world and with lesser supply coming into the market. And um, I will echo what uh, what uh, Jens Peter said that we're going to start 2021 with tightness uh, in that market. And that's going to be with us for a little while. Um, I think in Surimi in particular, what we saw in, in the European markets that when the pandemic hit, there was actually a little bit of a downwards trend in demand over there because there's been a push in recent years for Surimi to take up a, a bigger share of chilled uh, uh, supply in Europe. Um, and as you all know, when, when the pandemic hit and the retailers were trying to figure out what to do with that and, and suppliers were trying to redesign their supply chain to accommodate the new situation. Uh, chilled was de-emphasized and, and frozen was what everybody wanted. Uh, there was a lot of pantry loading in the beginning. Um, and so there was that slight softening of demand, but there's a switch in the, in, the, in the production very fast so that you saw a bigger supply into frozen Surimi analog products, uh, which really helped uh, boost that, uh, that demand uh, uh, relatively quickly after the pandemic hit. So, uh, overall, Surimi is faring quite well from a demand standpoint. The, the real challenge right now is really on the supply side. Okay, um, yeah, thanks, Rasmus. Um, maybe Jens Peter, you could come back in here, you know, with Nasiri's position, both as a kind of, um, you know, a, a producer of Surimi with the, the Alaskan companies and, you know, one of the biggest buyers in Japan. Like, what's the, the feeling within the group, um, given the, you know, the situation on supply and then the outlook for, for, for next year? Overall, um, uh, we we see the market, uh, the Serene market, really split uh, a little bit in, the, in two ways, uh, meaning that um, uh, the lower grades, uh, because of the smaller fish, uh, has been okay production-wise. The volumes are okay, uh, maybe a little bit more than uh, than demand uh, actually. Whereas the higher grades are where we have the uh, the issues uh, on uh, on supply and demand. Um, and that really goes for, for Japan as well. Uh, the Hokkaido fishery, uh, Pollock Serimi production in Japan has had uh, two pretty good years uh, in a row, uh, but that uh, fishery only produces low grade Surimi. So, uh, in terms of imports, the Japan uh, businesses have really been looking to the Hokkaido supply more than the Alaskan Pollock, or sorry, the Alaskan supply, perhaps. So we see a huge demand for high level uh, grades uh, where the lower grades are maybe a little bit uh, uh, more in balance or maybe a slight oversupply compared to uh, the demand. And is that just because the, um, the, the, the poor fishing situation means it's tougher to produce? If you're getting you know, smaller fish, is it tougher to produce the high grade of Surimi? Is that? That's correct, that's correct. You know, it's the smaller fish that uh, becomes a problem both for the uh, the blocks, but also for the Surimi, um, uh, uh, the structure and so on in, in the bigger um, fish gets better and higher grades of Surimi. So, so that's why we're out of balance in this. And I think, I don't know, Rasmus, I think you said uh, the last year was pretty good, but I think we've experienced two years in a row where the fish were small, uh, meaning uh, lower grades uh, production is up compared to higher grades, where we in Europe really have a, a much higher demand for, for high grades than low grades. Okay, thanks. That's yeah, really in interesting stuff. Um, maybe Pascal, now you can give um, give a sense of the of the kind of interplay between uh, Pollock Sremi and Warm Water Sremi this year in the market, and then give us your take on on you, how you think the kind of the overall market will react with this um, you know coming, I guess, U.S. supply um, shortfall. Pascal, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. Yes. Yes, I was saying the, the year started with COVID-19, which was quite a big disruptor in the, in the industry in general and the streaming industry in particular. I, my feeling is what happened is the demand was quite low in the beginning of the year as uh, many companies were feeling a lot of uncertainty about sales and uh, preferred to stay low on inventory rather than, than keep... Uh, high level with no knowledge about what was going next and the fear that maybe market would collapse and price would go down and they would be stuck with uh, inventory at high prices. So it's, we, we started the first half of the year with not very 
aggressive sales, not very good good market, but low inventory on the on the buyer side. And uh, then in the second half of your uh, summertime is a slow season for the Surimi market, except uh, Europe. And, but overall, the, the global market, the, the summer is a slow, slow, slow time. And now summer is passed, we're getting in the high season. And what do we see? I think first we see the Pollock Surimi production down probably between 20 to 30,000 tons. Uh, as a collateral of the problem of fishing in Alaska, I think the same is happening for Pacific whiting. Uh, to my knowledge, there is practically no, there's been practically no season, no, no bee season for Pacific whiting this year. And when you look at the other side in uh, in the Southeast Asia, production was already down last year. In, in Southeast Asia, you have basically four major production countries: uh, China, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, India. Okay, India, Thailand is the order. Uh, among these countries. Uh, I would say Thailand has got to such level that it cannot go down further. Thailand is down to 50,000 tons and it's pretty stable. Uh, as a reminder, Thailand was producing 150,000 tons uh, 15 years ago. Vietnam is also stable. But Vietnam is stable when you look at the supply of fish to Vietnam. You have a very large decrease of the good quality fish, uh, Itoyuri. And uh, the volume that uh, is landed and the use for surimi more and more is... Uh, a dark fish and low quality fish. So there is a deficit of a high grade surimi, definitely. Vietnam is not a producer of high grade surimi, but even in the medium grade, there is a problem. Look at, when you look at India, the volume last year was already down uh, significantly. I don't remember exact numbers, but it's uh, uh, something like a 20,000 ton drop compared to the high of uh, the previous years, uh, 2017 18. And this year follows the same trend, it's even worse. The, the drop in uh, production in India is very, very significant. And the uh, drop in production of high-grade surimi in India is even more significant. Uh, and then uh, China. China production was uh, low due to the pandemic in the first half year. And then you had the flooding. In, in China, you have basically two kinds of production. You have the sea fish. Uh, surimi, which is mostly low-grade uh, dark surimi, and the Chinese usually blend this product with uh, uh, silver carp, so freshwater surimi, which gives uh, the high-grade, good-quality surimi to blend, well, they blend together for the product. And the problem with silver carp this year is the flooding that they had in China. Uh, I think it was in the spring, and uh, everybody predicts that the, the numbers will be low also, and uh, we can see already very strong demand from China for high-grade surimi from Southeast Asia. China is not a big buyer of product surimi, of course, but in the high-grade side, uh, Itoyori from uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, uh, Vietnam, uh, China is a uh, quite large buyer. and They are buying very aggressively at this time. So now maybe take a look a little bit at what's hap what happened in Japan, give some idea what, what's coming up. I think until maybe what, two, three months ago, uh, nobody would mention anything about the possible shortage in the market. And then we get uh, further, further in the in the B season, and it started to appear quite obvious that there would be a deficit of uh, Pollock surimi. And to this deficit of Pollock surimi, again, is adding a deficit of uh, Pacific whiting, a deficit of Itoyuri in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And we're getting into the high season, and where is surimi available? Nowhere. So I talked to some buyers uh, recently who, okay, the, of course, prefer to keep silent about it, but they, they recognize everybody struggling to feed the factories for the end of the year in Japan. And they're looking forward to the A season 2021 to recover. But how can they recover in a season 2021? I'm, I'm very skeptical about this. So for, okay, we talked about Hokkaido. Yes, Hokkaido had the good landings uh, uh, over the, the earlier this year, but uh, the same uh, surimi production in Hokkaido is over. Now they moved to the uh, Sea of Otox and Pacific Ocean and there is no, practically no catch and no production there. So, when you look at inventory in Japan at this time, it's basically record low. I think I was looking at the statistics a little bit earlier, and we are back to the same level, which was the, the uh, 
record low, which were 2017-18. Okay, the, the consumption in Japan went down a little bit in the uh, in, uh, past few years, almost stabilized. Uh, according to the consumption statistics also, the actually consumption this year in Japan is pretty good. But uh, imports are very low compared to what it was the last two years. And uh, I wonder what's going to happen in the coming months, because I, I, I pre personally, I see Suriname market very hot, coming uh, and getting hotter and hotter in the coming months. But do you especially think for a... high grade, especially for high grade. As, uh, as uh, it was mentioned, uh, the demand for low grade is a little bit different. Uh, and when we talk about low grade also, you have to distinguish uh, the U.S. Uh, low grade is basically the Asian medium grade. Uh, I think the market is more or less balanced. And when you go to the lower, lower grades, uh, I can say we are in a situation of uh, somehow overproduction because of what I was saying before. The quality of fish landed both in Vietnam, in India, uh, or in China is getting uh, worse and worse. The fish is smaller, the, the quality lower. So the production of this kind of surimi is, getting, is increasing. But on the medium grade, high grade, medium grade balance may be a little bit tight, but on the high grade, that's a very serious uh, shortage. Okay, well, well, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Pascal. Um, I think we've we've covered um, Surimi kind of a fair bit there, so it'd be nice nice to turn to the um, the Philic market and, and maybe uh, Klaus, you could kind of give us from a um, you know from a processor's point of view, um, you know, what does this kind of lower US BBO production um, situation you know have you thinking in terms of the kind of you know the price outlook for next year you know like you know, give us give us a sense of what you're thinking about how the market's going to develop um for the rest of this year or well, next year really class you're on mute mute okay now you should hear me yeah uh thank you uh looking uh three months ago uh, there was a slight indication that probably single frozen PBO prices might go down, uh, driven by extremely low double frozen prices, as you've presented uh, in the beginning. Um, this has changed. Uh, there are no official quotations in the market right now. And we know from the history that uh, around Groundfish Forum times, there are a lot of price discussions or uh, heating up the market. But uh, it is different. What we hear now is that processes um, try to get in price increase. I don't know to, to what extent. And it depends a little bit where, where double frozen prices will, will move to. Uh, we see a slight increase in, in China, but prices are still around, uh, as you've shown as well, $3,000. So is there room for another price increase? There, it will be definitely tested and some processes in germany might be short but they probably insist as well that uh, the producers fulfill the contracts on existing uh, on existing contract basis um, on the other hand um, the key question is the poor fishing in alaska was mainly in in b season if we compare a season this year with a season last year we see that the output, at least of blocks, not surimi, but of blocks, was quite stable. And the key question is, will we see this lower yields and poor fishing in Alaska as well in A season last next year? Or do we need to compare uh, B season with B season and A season with A season? So um, I don't know. On the, on the bearish side, um, some food service processors holding still stocks um, because the food service sector is, is down due to COVID-19. And I think they will have sufficient inventory to cover at least the demand beginning of, of next year. Uh, will there an increase for um, single frozen PBO, which goes into the retail market? If I look at the industry, most of the processors, if not all, are running full capacity. So the, cap the production capacity at the moment constrains the, uh, constrains the demand. So can it increase? Uh, that's quite, quite difficult to, to say. Um, and 
on the other hand, there is some stock building taking place in in uh, Europe um, of raw material or finished goods um, because of the COVID-19 uncertainties in this market. And another factor which we haven't discussed is uh, is Brexit and pros po possible uh, tariffs. So uh, there there are inventories of finished goods, semi-finished goods, and raw material um, to to mitigate uh, these these kind of risk. So uh, back to your question, yeah, it might be that uh, the industry is targeting for for higher prices here, but to what extent? and how successful they will be depends as well on other factors I've just described. Yeah, oh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, do, do you, with regards to the gap between um, double and single frozen pricing, which I guess probably, I don't know if it's ever been wider than it currently is, it must almost be a record level, but do you think that that, is that a kind of a new normal or is that gonna inevitably close kind of next year? Um, <laughs> My personal perspective is that it's quite unusual, and I'm quite long in the business, and I can confirm that I haven't seen such a, such a big gap in, in, in my career. Um, will it continue? It depends a little bit um, where prices really move to. Um, it's not sustainable, but short term it might continue, or it might probably go down a little uh, if double frozen prices um increase um if single frozen prices increase at the same level we will say well, we will see the same the same gap uh, is that long term sustainable i don't think so because if you have a 800 or 1000 dollar price difference per ton it will force the industry to uh, look at possibilities to substitute double frozen by single frozen because that's a big cost saving or as well to look to um, alternative species, whatever that is. So I think short term, um, this gap will stay at least in A season, but uh, will it stay in B season or will it stay on a longer period? Um, that's not sustainable, I think. Then the market will change. Okay, thanks Klaus. And another question for you actually. Um... You know, with, with regards to the, the focus of the EU, um, you know, the EU industry, uh, the big German retailers, uh, very focused on having MSC certified products. But we have this situation where, you know, a major supplier of, um, of MSC certified uh, PBO, uh, Russian fishery, it looks like, well, they, you know, they, as it stands at the minute, they've lost their, they will no longer be able to sell MSC certified products. Um, and just how big a deal is that for, for the processing sector? In, in 2021? I mean, is this something where it's a, it sort of feels like a big deal in the industry, but the market will just kind of ride it out? Or, or do you think that this, this is actually a big deal? Because I guess it does, you know, on one hand, create a deficit in, in the market of blocks. Short term, it's a big deal, I think. Um, it makes the sourcing situation even more complicated or more difficult at the moment. Uh, or in other words, it just adds fuel to the fire. Um, because uh, it's not happening in, in next year. Uh, we know that um, some Russian processing uh, fishing or fishing companies taking their remaining quota uh, in 2020 in, in November and December. Um, this is the same situation for, for Russian Sea, and uh, they are not able to, my knowledge, to claim that NSC any longer. So. Uh, this product produced this year is scheduled for arrival in February, March next year. And uh, this will create as well a um, shortage. So short term again, it, it, has, an, it has an impact um, on the availability of, of products. Um, but PBO is, is um, only one kind of product format. And the total production is, I think you mentioned 15,000 tons or 13,000 tons. That's that's nearly correct. I have 15,000 tons here. Uh, will it be compensated by other industry members or how long will they be without an MSU certification? That's the question mark here. But knowing the Russian industry, hearing that the quota might increase um, on the longer run, it uh, the shortfall might be 
compensated. And uh, uh, on the other hand, Russian sea needs to, or Russian fishery needs to fix that that issue. Uh, without an MSC certification, they are not a player in, uh, not a significant player in that market uh, any longer, especially in the European market. Hmm. On the other, on the other hand, we have the H and G production, and keep in mind as well that uh, uh, Russian sea is producing around about sixty thousand tons or sixty six thousand tons uh, double frozen MSC material for China. And we need to take into consideration that uh, it might have an impact on the availability of MSC HNG in China. Um, knowing that uh, the HNG volume is around 800,000 tons, 850,000 tons in Asia, uh, you can ask yourself, is 60, 50 to 60,000 tons a significant number or isn't it? So um, that's a little bit of speculation. But again, short term, it creates further issues. Thanks, Klaus. It's really, really great stuff. Um, and yes, Sturi, is it, you know, as a uh, working with, you know, as you work for another Russian company, and what is your take on this um, Russian fishery MSC situation? Um, is it is it possible that the can be resolved? Uh, and if not, what do you expect the market impact to be? And you know, will it cause a further widening of the premium between MSC and non-MSC, you know, pricing in the future? So, so multiple questions, but all connected, I guess. I guess that uh, we, we probably haven't heard the last of this uh, Russian fishery uh, issue, but uh, we're going from the assumption that they have lost their MSC certification and, and I have no other information in that regard. So I, I think they will be without MSC certification uh, next year at least. And they being uh, one of the biggest suppliers of, of block from Russia that will clearly have a significant impact on the market. What the exact impact is going to be is is, uh, is open for speculation, so, so it's always difficult to say. But uh, before we had this issue, we had uh, we already had a, a big uh, difference between MSC and non-MSC in, in price. That probably had to do mostly with uh, with the problems in food service, because the because the non MSC is probably more reliant on on uh, on the food service segment, so so maybe that's partly COVID related. So further down the line, that will probably even out a bit. But uh, for this situation with uh, Russian Sea, it will definitely have uh, an impact. And, and as Klaus uh, alluded to, there will be more non MSC. Uh, there will probably be both more non-MSC block produced and more non-MSC H&G. So, so I would expect that the uh, the gap between non-MSC and MSC will probably remain, but uh, but the balance there in between it's uh, it's actually difficult to predict what, what's going to happen, but the impact will be probably significant. Yeah, because because correct me if I'm wrong, it's one of those issues, isn't it, where it's um, the retailer is not going to kind of uh, budge on this. It's a retailer policy, and it's not going to change. So they're not going to kind of go, oh, it's okay, you were MSC before. Well, you know, it's just going to be surely a black and white situation for for the retailers, isn't it? So um, yeah, it's going to create an interesting situation in the market because of that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's difficult to say how how that's going to. Uh, no, but I'm sure some of the customers will probably take some anonymity, but but probably in very limited quantity, like, like you explained. Well, well, thanks, thanks, Terry. Rasmus, maybe you could kind of chip in on on this this point um, and give give some sense, um, you know, about about what what you think about this situation, and you know, from from a, from an Alaskan company point of view, and is there a sense that the Alaskan companies, you know, would have to be careful about, you know. With regards to pushing the, with prices going too high, if um, if MSC um, demand really does go up uh, that much, yeah, I mean, I can echo what Klaus said uh, just before and said, you know, short term we do have some big issues in the supply chain here. That's uh, that's that's pretty obvious right now with the shortfall out of Alaska and continued good supply combined with very little uh, product in inventory right now. There is a tightness going into twenty twenty one. 
And this situation with Russian fishery is just going to, like Klaus said, uh, fuel that fire quite a bit. So short term, this is, this is quite concerning for the industry. Um, to Sturey's point, I, I don't know how this is all going to play out and, and how the chips are going to land. Um, there will most likely be an impact on pricing overall, because as you all know, our oh, industry, no, our industry is well, pricing of our products is based on supply and demand. And, and right now we're definitely in a situation where there is much more demand than there is uh, supply. So that usually leads to an impact on pricing. But, you know, uh, Alaska Pollock has been the value product in the in the seafood world for uh, as long as I've been in the industry, which is quite a while. And I think uh, Alaska Pollock has continued to be that um, going forward. Um, the market will adjust to what the market is able to bear both short term and long term. So, so uh, you know, speculate on actual price points going into the A season at this point is a little bit of a stretch. Um, for our sake, uh, you know, we're in the middle of, or well, nudging towards the end of our B season. We've not started any conversations about 2021 um, at all at this point, because we really need to see where we're gonna end up this uh, season in Alaska to know, you know, uh, what is the shortfall? What do we need to do with that? And, and how do we then bridge that into our new plan production for the A season? And that's work that's going to happen here. Um, and now, and give us a sense on live streaming is on. I think we're we'll maybe come back on there, hopefully. Um, Jens, Jens Peter, maybe you could give us a sense on this kind of MSC, um, d you know, demand dynamic um, with, with regards to, you know, the, the, the reduced volume into the market next year from. From, um, from Russian fishery, do you, do you think it w there'll be a widening of um, the, the gap between um, non-certified uh, uh, products and certified products, or would you think the sort of market will, you know, naturally sort of sort itself out? You're you're muted. Unmuted. Yeah. Yep. Good. Um... There is quite a big gap at the moment, as we've uh, discussed already. Um, I don't know if it's going to be uh, widening this gap. Uh, uh, like we've discussed mm. also, um, a lot of the uh, non MSC goes into the uh, catering business, the Horesta uh, business, uh, big events uh, and so on, schools, institutions and so on. They're basically all closed, you know, so it's a big problem for the uh, non MSC cover frozen <coughs> production. Uh, I don't see any of the retailers budging on uh, the MSC. Uh, I mean, there's been a long march towards where we are today, so I don't see that really changing. Uh, I don't see anybody saying uh, we'll completely uh, drop the MSC, we'll uh, move on to non-MSC products, but maybe there will be smaller lines uh, where you can make some promotions, uh, the retail segment as well, but it more or less has to go to either new geographical areas or it uh, has to or the, or the market has to see uh, the catering business start up again. You know, maybe we can, hopefully we can see um, um, a loosening up uh, on all the COVID uh, issues uh, coming into the first quarter of uh, 21, where you can see some of the restaurants, uh, schools, institutions, uh, big conferences and so on start up again. And then you will have a better flow of the uh, double frozen non-MSC uh, production going through. Uh, but I'm more counting on uh, new areas being uh, opened up uh, over time. If I look at the sort of general trend, uh, what's going to happen, uh, I think it's great that uh, Russia has finally come around to uh, invest in uh, new uh, technology, getting new uh, vessels out, not being reliant on the double frozen uh, channels uh, that has been going on for many years. We also see more Russian companies establishing uh, land-based production for single frozen uh, production as well. Lifting the quality, uh, I think there's a lot of good trends going on at the moment, but of course it will take years before we move into a situation where it's completely different. So looking at 21, I don't see many, uh, uh, I don't see much difference between now and uh, and 21. It's even going to be tighter, I think. Widening the gap of, uh, of the prices, I doubt it. I think it's big enough at the moment. Uh, so I think it'll remain in that area. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jens Peter. And um, we haven't actually got a panelist representing the Chinese industry on here, but obviously um, Naribo and other Russian firms are sending a lot of um, H and G there. Um, we've seen uh, there was disruption in Dalian initially, and now um, now Qingdao with um, Qingdao Port being being closed to the um, closed to tramp, uh, transport vessels um, due to the you know these supposed coronavirus findings. Um, so so Stiri, can you can you tell us like, what what what's happened? Are you are you um, still um, getting products 
in into the country is just taking longer or are you directing products elsewhere um and you know what are you thinking in terms of how long this this situation will kind of continue for yes there, <clears throat> there have clearly been uh, major disruptions in, in china recently with uh, taking product in uh Qingdao has been uh, almost closed up till now and uh but we have, we have been bringing some product into Italian. It, it's slow uh, there, but but product is is moving. Uh, the the Chinese are trying to get uh, hold of the situation, get it under control. Uh, there is a lot of pressure now from the uh, processing industry because uh, they are facing major problems, not getting their hands on on the raw material. Uh, obviously, if you look at the volume, for example, of uh, H and G Pollock coming from Russia to China, it's probably going to be somewhere plus minus five hundred and fifty thousand ton on an annual basis. So, so uh, it makes a huge difference for for the processing companies in in uh, China. So they are now lobbying authorities over there to. Uh, to put in place some procedures and uh, and measures so so that they can uh, continue to get product through. There has been some progress in in uh, in recent days, and, and we are seeing every day now something is happening, and, and we are we are expecting that in in coming days and weeks that we will see some progress, and uh, we expect in the longer run that we will continue to bring H and G to. Uh, to China, because uh, I think the Chinese uh, authorities have already uh, realized how important this it is for the uh, for the workers and, and for the communities over there. So, so uh, I think we will see some kind of uh, progress pretty soon. Is there work being done from the industry as well to kind of um, on the you know on the scientific side? Because um, you know, like the science seems to be slightly kind of sketchy at best. Uh, you know, I don't don't want to kind of. But what is the Russian industry doing? You know, uh, putting forward, you know, um, you know, propose, you know, proposals to the Chinese side on the science, and you know, um, is work being done on that front as well? Mm -hmm. Well, there have been uh, yes, pe people look at this probably in, in in different ways, and there are some disagreements on on how how to look at this. Uh, the Russians, like like many other producers, producing countries, have have been trying to take uh, measures to uh, to make sure we don't have these problems. We we have a lot of measures in terms of the crews going on board the vessels, making sure that they they do not get uh, sick. We we uh, we have even started to disinfect uh, cartons going from Russia. We we test them before they go. And so on and so forth. So we are taking a lot of measures to to, uh, to solve these issues, but uh, but it's it's a complicated issue as it stands at the, at the moment. And hopefully we, we will have some progress in all this, and hopefully the Chinese will come to some kind of a practical solution because uh, at the moment obviously it's not it's not working uh, as mm -hmm. it is. So uh, we we are uh, expecting that they will come to their senses at some point. So I presume there's been a bit of a logjam into Dalian if everyone's trying to get products into Dalian and then what and then it gets transported by trucks, does it up to Qingdao? Is that's kind of what's happening? Yeah, that's true. Mm. All right. Well thanks. Thanks, Siri. That's 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 um really interesting stuff. Um and I guess it, it, it maybe you could give it, it might be too early to say, but what are you thinking with regards to, to H and G kind of demand and pricing next year, or is it really kind of too early to say on that given all the kind of uncertainty that's going on? Because obviously, you know, Chinese New Year. Uh, you know, surely people are bu wanting to buy raw material to cover themselves for Chinese New Year, right? Yes, like I say, the Chinese are now in trouble because they can't get hold of uh, raw mm. material. So, so they are now very short. They haven't covered themselves up to the Chinese New Year. So, so they need to fill up their plants with more raw material. So, uh, raw material is definitely tight. Uh, prices are on the increase. Uh, how this will translate into uh, a season is uh, very difficult to say at this point. Uh, that will again uh, depend on uh, probably how how the, how the season starts, what is going to be the size of fish, and 
how, how much is going to be produced as block and how much is in G and, and so on. So it's uh, almost, there, there are so many uncertainties at the moment, that it's almost impossible to predict. Okay, thanks, 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 Thierry. Um, I'd like to come back to to Surimi uh, and and Russia, actually, really, because obviously there's there's plans from um, from Russian fishery, and I think I think maybe some of the other companies to produce um, Surimi on the new trawlers they're building. Um, the first the first of these uh, Russian fishery trawlers, I think, it will arrive at the end of this year. Um, I think it will start fishing next year, at least for some of next year. Um, and obviously, we're not going to see big volumes of Surimi produced next year, maybe not even the year after, but. Pascal, I mean, what do you think about the kind of, you know, the, the potential of Russia as a sort of significant Surimi, uh, you know, producer in the future? I mean, do you think that it's, it's, it's likely that Russia could be producing sort of similar volumes to the US, you know, in like, you know, five, ten years time? Or is that just, you know, like just, unrealistic? You're on mute, Pascal. Yes, difficult to answer. I had a question from uh, one of my customers in Russia today. He, he knew I was going to participate to the webinar. We'll talk about it. And he told me, oh, but, uh, Pascal, you know there, there are uh, two or three vessels coming out uh, uh, in, the, in Russia for new season uh, to 2021, which have uh, Surimi production capability only on board, no fillet production capability. And, uh, I don't know anything about that, but I told him, in my opinion, it's very unlikely. It would be a completely change of, uh, of the way of doing business of uh, Russians. So when you look in the past, okay, the, the Russia stopped producing Surimi on, on board factory trawlers uh, maybe over 10, 15 years ago. But at that time, they never focused on Surimi. They focused on the fillet block, which is better revenue than Surimi. And, and they would do Surimi, I think, in the last resort. So if, if, if Russia becomes a significant producer of uh, Pollock Surimi, it would be a big change. Uh, maybe one, one reason why it could drive them to do so is that these problems with MSC. Because uh, I see the, the, the demand and the market for high-grade Pollock uh, Surimi being very strong in the coming year. And uh, uh, if you have vessels which have lost uh, MSC certification, you have a possibility to produce Surimi. Why not target the Japanese market and forget about Europe for a while? I think it would make some uh, somehow some sense. Yeah, that, that's an interesting theory. Thanks, Pascal. Um, and also, like I know it's not really Pollock, but it obviously affects Pollock. I wonder if you could give a bit of a kind of um, crystal ball, forward-looking outlook on what will happen with the kind of you know the the warm water. Um, fisheries in Asia, you know, which are used to produce surimi base, because I mean, all the news that you ever read is about overfishing, volumes going down, you know. But like, obviously, this is a major component of the um, the global industry. So, I mean, what's going to happen to, you know, to this to sort of you know sort of resolve this situation in the longer term? Yes, I think this is a very interesting subject. Actually, it's something I've been working on for quite some time. I spent uh, I spent nearly two months uh, with. Uh, a couple of colleagues to, to prepare a report about the, the state of the Southeast Asian fishery and the impact of the stream industry and uh, uh, be trying to look at what, what we're looking at for the, for the coming years. I came to the conclusion that you, you have two things happening. First, uh, no doubt the, the tropical fishery is uh, overfished and uh, the situation is getting worse year after year. Only, only since uh, the Thailand got the, the, the yellow card from the uh, EU, uh, changed uh, the rules, took out uh, nearly half of the vessels from the fishery. We see some improvement, but it's going to take uh, probably uh, 10 years before the situation reverses. But you, when you look at the other countries, Vietnam, India, China, uh, or uh, Indonesia, uh, there is no, no sign, no chance. And, uh, Absolutely no way of improvement for, I would say, for the next 10 years. It's just going to get worse. And in front of that, you have a burgeoning market, which is uh, not burgeoning anymore. I think it's a very fast-growing market, which is the, 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 the market for the Surimi products in Southeast Asia. Uh, you saw how the, the Chinese market grew in 10 years from 10,000 tons to 1.5 million tons. 
uh, that was fed by the uh, first uh, development in parallel of the stream industry from sea fish and uh, very very sh uh, quickly within less than 10 years they exhausted the, this resource and moved to the freshwater stream and i think this is the future i think that's where we're going to uh, Surimi cannot, okay, except for the small portion of the market, which is a high-grade product, and I think, uh, of course, uh, Alaskan Pollock uh, from Factory Torres, we always find a market for, for this. The mass market, is a, Surimi is a cheap product. It's a product for the mass. It has to be cheap, and uh, where it's going to come from, I believe it will be from freshwater, freshwater fish. And I think this change has started. Uh, uh, I see... For instance, in Vietnam, there was absolutely no production of freshwater surimi even two years ago. And uh, today, maybe already four or five factories started production. Uh, China is a little bit ahead. Um, already China producing 70,000 tons of freshwater surimi. And all the good quality surimi, practically all the good quality surimi in China is coming from, uh, from freshwater fish. I think there is good, great potential because uh, what are the big countries in this is uh, India, Indonesia, China, Bangladesh, uh, these are all markets that are going to see uh, rapid growth in the uh, consumption of surimi products. This is the case for Vietnam also. You could not see surimi products in Vietnam only uh, three, four years ago, and now you go out. Uh, I, yesterday in Vung Tao, uh, I saw one new shop opening, uh, specialized selling on these surimi products. Uh, this you, you didn't see only one, two years ago. So there is really something happening. And, uh, It'd be very interesting to see what, what's coming next. Well, thanks, thanks, Pascal. Um, I think I'm going to going to um, now we're we're kind of I'm conscious we're getting short on time here, so I'd like to to cut to the the Q and A. We've got some interesting questions have come in from um, from uh, from from viewers. First, first one is from um, Christian Yeltsin from uh, from Naribo, um, colleague of, uh, of Stiris, um, so, uh, saying to Klaus and Jens Peter. How fast can value-added producers uh, grow markets for non-MSC um, Alaska Pollock products? So maybe Klaus, you could answer first, and Jens Peter, you could answer second. Uh, it depends a little bit, but uh, as you mentioned already, the MSC certification and uh, selling products with that logo in in Europe, particularly in Northern Europe, is is essential. So. Uh, I think to create products which can't carry this MSC logo is quite difficult, quite challenging for the industry. Um, we might see some in the food service sector, uh, but in other areas it, it may become more complicated. Then we'll have to look at, at different, different regions, which isn't Europe probably. Is, there must be a segment of the retail, though. For example, in the UK, I, you know, think of say Iceland, um, or you know, kind of um, there's more, you know, like the value level of, of the retail. But I guess in Germany, actually, the you know the value would be Aldi and Lidl, and they are the drivers of the MSC, aren't they? So it doesn't maybe apply. But I'm just wondering whether there will be segments of the retail sector that would, would potentially take non-MSC products, um, but but maybe not. Uh, Jens Peter, what do you think on that? Uh, I, I agree with Klaus. Uh, I think uh, we've come too far down the road with the uh, MSC acceptance uh, for any of the big retailers to uh, get on board. Uh, there might be some, uh, some smaller retailers that will see a big gap in pricing and uh, utilize that uh, in certain areas, but it's not going to change the big volume. Uh, what we have done is, uh, is maybe look at uh, looking at uh, uh, different geographical um, <coughs> situations where MSC um, it's not known, you know, with South America, uh, India, Asia in general. Uh, there's a lot of big uh, countries uh, with a lot of uh, people, Indonesia, India, and so on. Uh, also, of course, uh, China, where MSC is not known. Uh, these markets should be opened up if you want to have new avenues. I don't really see big changes. Smaller changes, yes, because of the big price gap. Some will jump on board, but you won't have some of the big guns because they will be under fire immediately from all sources uh, if they start to promote something that doesn't have the MSC logo. I don't see it happening. Thanks. Um, yeah, we've got a question here from um, from Andrew Jensen from Pacific Seafood in the US, um, which I guess would be one one for Sturie. 
So going into 2021, do you expect Russia to continue to produce 600,000 tonnes of H&G per year, or do you see the fleet starting to convert over to, to more single frozen items? Um, so, Stiri. Yes, as I said earlier, I, th I think many producers will strive to do a bit more block, single frozen block. Uh, it will depend on the fish size in the, in the A season. So over the last two years, we've had small fish. If we have the same situation again this season, which is actually quite likely, we will be uh, restrained by, by that factor. So, so, uh, so we might see slightly more production of block, but uh, probably not significantly more. So, so some of the producers will try to pick up what uh, what uh, Russian fisheries leave behind with the uh, MSC. Uh, but there is uh, this limited capacity, and, and the vessels also. Uh, it is uh, uh, also to some extent depends on uh, how how the vessels are set up. Some vessels are more set up for fillet, and more for, some more for HNG. So, so there's not endless capacity to produce uh, fillet blocks. So, so I, I would expect that there'll be slightly more. Fillet block production, but, but it will be limited. This increase. Do you think there's going to be more focus on the Russian mar on the Russian domestic market? Because uh, that's kind of you know significant. You know, uh, well, how big do you think that market is, and do you, will that is that potential to grow that next year? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm sure uh, people will uh, will try to put uh, profit into the Russian market. We've seen uh, you know the block. Recent years, we've seen between 20 to 25,000 tons of the block sold domestically in Russia. And I'm sure we'll continue to uh, see that, and that some people will try to, to sell more in, into that market. Because correct me if I'm wrong. So some HG going to the domestic market as well. So isn't, isn't, isn't that the kind of strategy of the, um, the land, the, the plants on land, uh, you know, with yeah. which are uh, starting to be set up to, to focus them on the could almost replace what China does, but focus them on the domestic market partly. Yes, I mean there is more than two hundred thousand ton of, of the Russian quota that is uh, coastal quota. That uh, that is mostly used by these land-based plants, and, and a big chunk of their production is is oriented for for the domestic market. There's a lot, a lot of development going on there. Okay, well, well, thanks. Um... Thank, thanks a lot, Stiri. We kind of we're through the questions. Oh, there's actually interesting questions come up here, which is um, what could you know what could alternative um, whitefish um, species be? And this is from um, Adele Fortune from from I and J in South Africa. Um, so um, yeah, maybe I guess from a from a processor's point of view, Klaus, you sort of touched upon it earlier, like what. Um, you know that there might potentially be if this market is very hot there might be demand for um you, know, you might see maybe pangasius blocks start to come back into europe or you know i mean obviously the you know that there's been a big hike in the cod quota uh anti cod quota i mean cod's still highly priced but could that be you know like just just one in class from a process point of view what you you think on that in terms of potential competition for pollock uh if if, if indeed there is any yeah <laughs> yeah um it's a key question, and, and and we've seen already that that some processors have taken a precautionary risk management approach here, and we've seen recently on a on a small basis that uh, some companies promoted uh, Sace or Coley, for instance, um, as an alternative, and promoted as well the uh, country of origin, or saying it's locally sourced. Uh, so we have seen that there are other species which can compensate hokey, but as Rasmus uh, mentioned already, Alaska pollock is, is, is value priced. And of course, it's hard to compete if we talk about price levels. Um, I remember also, and you mentioned it, uh, Tom, uh, 2009, when the US had uh, only a quota of 850,000 tons of pollock, and uh, Russia didn't have any Alaska Pollock MSC certification that the market moved to Pangasius. So uh, maybe some of the aquaculture species uh, might be 
might be an alternative. Um, in some areas, especially in Europe, so from my perspective, uh, a lot of companies are flexible to use different kinds of, of ground fish. Um, it can be hokey, it can be cut, it can be coli or, or, or pollock. Um, it's more a question of MSC and non MSC. And we discussed already this, uh, this topic. So locally sourced, can that be promoted? Aquaculture species, is, is that an option? Or the third one is probably underutilized species, which are entering the, the market or consumption at the moment as whole round or H and G um, instead of fillet blocks. And can we add more value to these kind of, of raw materials? Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Klaus. Um, and I think that probably brings us to a close now. We're, we're, we're out of time. We're, we're already uh, obviously late, which I apologize for, um, late starting. Sorry to, sorry to that, to the panelists and, and the audience. Um, thanks, thanks to everyone for your time. Hope you found that um, an informative and useful discussion. Um, and yeah, have a good day, afternoon, evening, um, wherever you are in the world. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.